Not too long ago, a viewer sent me lots of electronic components, which for example included a whole lot of different ICs, two big motors and most importantly tons of my favorite electronic components, LEDs. But he did not only send over those 10mm light emitting diodes, but also three custom-made LED matrices which featured 32 LEDs in the X direction and 12 LEDs in the Y direction, so a total of whopping 384 LEDs per matrix. Those are soldered onto a big PCB, to which also male and female headers, as well as a couple of ICs, capacitors and resistors are soldered onto. Now by applying a voltage directly to the LEDs, we can see that they all still seem to work correctly. So of course, I want to use this LED matrix to display something useful, like for example ladders. That is why in this video we will firstly reverse engineer the PCB connections, then find out how the ICs, so called shift registers, are used to control the LEDs, and finally what kind of microcontroller codes we have to write in order to properly control the matrix. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB, whose factory is even open during Chinese New Year, so that overseas customers can still get their common two layer PCBs. So upload your Gerbo files today to order 10 PCBs for only $2. Let's start off with the two headers on the top of the PCB, which are due to thick traces connected to one another in parallel. After doing a bit of probing around, I realized that the top 4 pins are connected to all the anodes of the LEDs in the first 3 lines, which are the lines 1 to 3. The next 4 pins are connected to all LED anodes in the lines 4, 5 and 6, and this wiring scheme then pretty much continues for the remaining 8 pins and the lines 7 to 12. Without questioning this wiring yet, I moved on to the cathodes of the LEDs and found out that they all connect to a pin of the 6 available STP16C596ICs, which according to the datasheet are 16 bits constant current LED sync drivers. That means that this IC connects our LED's cathode to ground and lets a constant current flow through it according to the utilized current set resistor value if there is a positive voltage connected to the LED's anodes. Here begins the confusing part though, because each of those ICs has only 16 outputs, which means we could manage a total of 96 LEDs, but we got 4 times that amount with 384. The solution is that the cathodes of each individual LED in every fourth line are connected in parallel. So by firstly connecting the upper three lines to the supply voltage, we can control all the LEDs in those individually by utilizing the LED sync ICs. Then we can move on to the next three lines by switching the supply voltage and control those LEDs and then we switch over once more and then one last time in order to light up all the LEDs individually. But we later go through those lines so quickly that our eyes do not notice this switching and instead sees a static picture. This functional principle is called multiplexing and it can save us lots of control pins for an LED matrix but you should definitely watch my standalone multiplexing video if you're confused right now. But anyway, after I determined and wrote down which IC with which output pin is connected to which LED cathodes, it was time for me to find out how to actually control the LED drivers. Their datasheet told me that they're actually 16-bit serial in parallel out shift registers that feeds a 16-bit D-type storage register, which sounds super confusing at first, but if we have a closer look at the block diagram, we can easily understand what they mean. The upper part is our storage register, 
and the lower part is the shift register. So let's start with that. As you can see, it consists of 16 of those blocks, with the labels D, Q and CK, which are called D-type flip-flops. If we dig deeper, we can find out that those D-type flip-flops consist of one inverter and four NANDs, which are logic gates with two inputs and one output. Depending on whether a high or low voltage, aka a 1 or 0, is applied to their inputs, they spit out a specific output voltage according to this truth table. Now feel free to apply different states to the D or data, NCK or clock inputs and find out for yourself how the Q output changes. But to spoil the fun, let me tell you that only if your clock signal is rising, the state of the data inputs is set on the output and stays there even if the data or clock input is low. But of course, if your data input is low and the clock rises, you got your output pulled down to low as well. So basically, a D-type flip-flop can save the state of one bit on the inputs. For our 16-bit shift register, we got 16 of those flip-flops cascaded, meaning the output of the first one is connected to the input of the second one and so on and on. As an example, let's set the SDI input to 1 and create a rising edge on the clock line. The 1 now got saved on the output 1, while the other flip-flop outputs saved their zeros. With the next rising edge, the previously saved 1 gets shifted to the right, but the output of the first flip-flop stays 1, because the input is still at a high voltage. Now by going through 16 rising clock cycles, the 1s get shifted to the right one step at a time. We could even attach the serial data input of another shift register to the serial data output of the first shift register to get a total of 32 output pins, while the data would still only shift from left to right. But why would you want such an IC? Well, if you listen carefully, you probably noticed that we only use two pins in order to control 16 output pins or more. This is important for microcontrollers with only a limited amount of GPIO pins, who want to control a lot of electrical components, like for example tons of LEDs in a big LED matrix. The type of shift register we had a look at is called SIPO, or Serial In Parallel Outs, which refers to the data type on the inputs and outputs. There also exists SISO, PISO and PIPO shift registers, whose usage is also important, but not as important as the SIPO type. Last but not least, for our IC, we got the D-type storage register, which like the name implies, are also simply D-type flip-flops. That means all we have to do is to trigger the connected LE pin of them once, in order to transport the output of the shift register to a logical end, whose output unable pin we can basically tie to ground in order to finally connect the shift register output to the constant current output. Of course, you can also find all this information in the truth table and timing diagram of the IC's datasheet. But anyway, after more investigation, I noticed that the input of the LED driver ICs are not directly connected to the lower male headers, but instead to two SN74LS14 ICs, which are hex Schmidt trigger inverters, to clean up the data signal. But once again, feel free to watch my video about Schmidt triggers to truly understand their purpose. Nevertheless, after I used my multimeter with its continuity function to find out which male header pin ultimately connects to which LED driver inputs, I connected the unable pin to ground, hooked up all the serial data pins, the clock pin and the latch pin to push buttons and finally connected power to the matrix. 
As you can see, if I keep the serial data input high and alternate between triggering the clock and the latch pin, you can see that the ones slowly get shifted through the shift register from left to right, which proves the theory we talked about earlier. But since push-button control will never grant us complete control over the matrix, I rather connected the data inputs to an Arduino Nano, which I then hooked up to my computer. In the codes, I set up the timer 1 of the Admega 32AP in order to create a timer compare interrupt at 100 microseconds and 200 microseconds, which I used to set the serial data and the clock line. Next, I created a small boolean matrix in order to form the word high and continued by utilizing the timer compare interrupts to set the serial data inputs according to this boolean matrix. Afterwards, it was time to upload the codes, which as you can see worked flawlessly. To add a bit of excitement though, I set up a second timer, which executes a timer compare interrupt every 10 milliseconds. This way I created a small, but let's face it pretty inefficient function that lets the boolean matrix values move one step to the right every half seconds. After uploading this code, this new function seemed to work acceptably well, but we only utilized the upper three lines so far, since I did not implement it multiplexing yet. To do that, I added four p-channel MOSFETs with pull-up resistors to the male supply voltage headers whose gates I then connected to four more digital pins of the Arduino. Next, I created a way bigger boolean matrix, which contained the word COOL, modified the timer compare function in order to cycle through the four three-line segments of the LED matrix while triggering the correct LEDs, and finally uploaded the codes. And as you can see, what I had in mind did work out but not perfectly yet, because with this video I did not only wanted to show you how easy and awesome it is to work with shift registers, but also that programming codes for such a big matrix can be quite challenging. And with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If so, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Stay creative and I will see you next time!